Welcome back to my channel. I'm Brian Kafka and I'm continuing Master Databricks and Open Source Apache Spark. This is lesson 30, PySpark. In this one, we're going to be covering something really useful, which is how to read from a SQL database. So let's jump in. I want to ask you to join my mission to train people around the world and take them from Padawan to Jedi Master. To do this, I need you to join my inner circle on Patreon by following the link in the description. With your support, I'll be able to do a lot more, not only for you, but for the community at large. Thank you. And remember, we're all in this together. Kapla, which is Klingon for success. We're jumping right in this time because there's not a lot of concepts to cover. We're going to be talking about reading from a SQL database using Java Database Connectivity, or JDBC. And I've got the demo code. I'll put the link in the description. But just bear in mind, this is code that you need to vet and test. It's just for demo purposes. It's not intended for production use. There's a useful link here you may want to reference. Remember, Databricks is really a wrapper around Apache Spark. So this is the Spark documentation about how to use JDBC, but it applies equally to both Databricks and Apache Spark. Now, this demo really is telling you how to connect to any relational databases using JDBC through Spark. But I'm going to have to pick one, so I picked the Azure SQL database because it's easy to set up. I'm using a serverless version, so I can basically it will pause after a timeout. So I'm using that, but the concepts are really the same. And I'm also coding this in Python, but the differences between doing this in Python or say Scala are really minimal because it's the same idea. You set properties, you set the URL, and you connect, etc. A couple of things we want to do before we jump in. One is we want to confirm the Azure services are allowed because remember Databricks is an Azure service. So we want to make sure it's allowed to connect to the Azure SQL database. It's also a good idea to make sure your client, your client's IP address can also get through the firewall to get to your SQL Server. Now I'm not going to go into creating the Azure SQL database, etc., but I have a link I will put in the description to a video where I do all that. But I will show you that when you go into your database, you just bring it up, mine was in the dashboard. So what you want to do is go into the overview blade of your database, and here mine's called SQL DB, and this is the server. And you want to go through and get to the set server firewall. A couple of things you need to check. One is this switch setting should say yes, so it should allow Azure services and resources to access the server. That should be set to yes. You have that opportunity when you create your database, but you also can change it later. The other thing you may want to do is add, see here, add your client IP. I've already done this, but if I click that, it automatically plugs in my client IP address and I can just save it. Those are the two big things you want to do so that you can easily get to your database. And again, in your own environment, make sure those are things you want from a security standpoint. This is just for demo purposes, and depending on what you're doing, I don't want to tell you you should or shouldn't do that. But if it's compliant with what you need to do, then by all means do that. If not, then check in your company to see what their standards are. Now, it's really pretty simple to go out and connect to your database. You just have to set a few properties. My code is going to be in Python, so I'm putting percent Python at the top of my code cells because actually I'm in a Scala notebook and I want to do Python code. I'm going to set some variables. I'm setting my user ID to the user ID for the database. I'm setting the DB password for the password. I'm setting the server name, the SQL server name that I gave it. You can get the database server name by going in the overview blade from the Azure portal for your database. And you can see right over here, the server name is here. So I would just cut that out and that would provide me with the value I want to put in here. So I just pasted that in there. My database name is SQL DB, and I'm using the port 1433. So these are the properties I need to have to get my connection, and I'm just putting them in variables to make things easier. You might be asking yourself a question, though. Is that really secure? Should I be putting the user ID and the password in clear text, they call it, easily read by anybody that has access to the notebook? probably not a good idea. Most of the time in Azure, you're going to want to use something called Azure Key Vault. Azure Key Vault is, like the name implies, it locks up secure bits of information and does not allow people to see it. Puts it kind of in a vault, and you have to use a special API to get things out of it. And even when you do, it won't show you the values. It redacts them so that you can't see what the values are. So I'm not going to actually go through the demonstration here, so I'll put a link in the description about how you can create your own Azure Key Vault. But in this example, I want to keep things real simple just to get through the basics. So I'm not going to do that here. But if you were doing that, then you would have something called a scope. 
and in there you would have where you keep your secrets you have this sort of name where you want to put your tags that you're hiding so in this case I called it AW key vault secrets and then I have a key in there called user ID and that's just a name I can't see what I put in there or wh whoever put it in there I can only retrieve it and same thing here for the password and I get to it from Databricks by calling dbutils.secrets.get and then this interfaces to the Azure Key Vault to get what I want. The main point of this is if I'm using Azure Key Vault I would just get the credentials the user ID and password from Key Vault and I, no one would ever see it. It would not be in clear text. And the person who's running this code would have to have the authorization to use the key vault. So I'm not doing that here. And if you try to run this notebook at home, it won't work because you'd have to set up a key vault and make sure everything's set up to make it work correctly. So going back to the way I am doing it, which is just a really kind of dumb and not secure way to do it, to demonstrate, I'm just going to run this code cell again that sets all my properties. And then I'm going to take those properties. And the first thing I need to do is format a URL that will connect me to my Azure SQL Server. So here it's setting up the URL and I'm passing in the JDBC host name which is the SQL Server and that's going to go into the zero parameter here. I'm going to be passing the port number into parameter one and JDBC database name which is just the database name for SQL there. So that's going to form a URL that can be called. The other thing I need is the connection properties which consists of the user ID the password and then the driver that it's going to use to connect to the database. So I'll save those. What I've created here is a variable called JDBC URL and a dictionary called connection properties. And then we're ready to go. We're going to say spark.read.jdbc. That's the open source standard function to read through JDBC. We're going to pass the URL we want to connect to right here. So we've already built that string. And we're going to just get the database salesLT.customer. When you create an Azure SQL database, a nice feature is you can choose to create a sample database, which is a subset of AdventureWorks. So it gives you something to play with. I did that in mind so I can retrieve sales LT customer. And then, of course, properties is our connect properties, which includes the credentials and the driver. And let's run that and see how it looks. All right, worked really well. And uh, simple as that, right? We just pass our table in, pull it in, we're good to go. You might be saying, but Brian, wait a minute. What if I have a lot of tables to get to? And what if. I want to actually just bring a few tables together. Maybe I want to do some joining before I uh, bring it into Spark. Maybe I want to just uh, aggregate data before it comes into Spark. Wouldn't it be better to let the database do that than bring it all into Spark first? The answer is yes. Yes, it would. That's called push down queries. So let's try that. And what I'll tell you up front is you do it the same way, almost identically, whether it's a push down query or just a table. We're going to build a doc string right here, which contains a query. And we're going to select just the columns we want, which is nice. We're pulling from one table here, the sales order header. We're going to join to sales LT.customer. And here's our join keys. So we're able to do joins. We could bring any number of tables. We can aggregate. We can do whatever we want. And then we can just pass this through. A couple of nuances is you do wrap this in parentheses, which we didn't do, obviously, with just a table name. And we give it like a tag here. In this case, we'll just call it cost. That's it. We've got this push down query ready to go. Then we do what we did before, spark.read.jdbc. The only thing changing is that now instead of a table name, we're passing a query in. Let's run it. Okay. And it worked great. And we can see we've got just the tables we want. This is a really powerful thing because very often you have a really nice back end server that can do all kinds of heavy lifting for you. It can do the joins, it can do filtering, it can do aggregations rather than bringing all this data over and then having to do that on your cluster. Let the database do as much work as possible if you can because that's going to make the spark load a lot easier, especially if you, you can filter a lot of the data over and you don't need to transfer all that data over the network. There's one other thing I wanted to call your attention to is you may want to know about the metadata that you've got on the backend server. You may want to know, for instance, what are the column names and what are the column types, etc. You can get that by using a standard schema inside of relational databases called information underscore schema. That's a special set of views that allow you to query what are the columns, what are the tables, etc. and what are the data types. So to give you an example, we're going to be, in this case, passing a query and we're asking for the table schema, column name, and data type from information schema dot columns. And we're going to say where the table underscore schema is sales LT and the table name is customer. So in other words, we just want to get a description of the columns in the customer table. And you can see here now we've got our column names, our data types, 
and we can even of course in here sort which is really useful because now we can see what the metadata looks like and mind you again this is passing this query through to the database it's telling us what the database is storing these are not spark data types these are the back-end database data types in this video we learn how to read from a SQL database using Java database connectivity JDBC on Apache Spark we used as an example an Azure SQL database because honestly it just made it a lot easier. It's very easy to set up. It's pretty cheap to set them up and get rid of them. But it could have been really any database on Azure. Uh, it's a little trickier if you want to cross into on-premise databases from the cloud. But in theory, all these things are possible because you're really just using the open source Java database connectivity to get to a database. What we specifically saw was how to retrieve an entire table where we just passed the table name as a parameter and we got the table back as a data frame. Then we saw how to run a select query. In this case, we could customize the query to do aggregation and joins, etc. And we called it a push down query because this was actually being pushed to the back end database to do the work. And finally, we looked at how we can query the database catalog, which is under information schema, to find out what the metadata of the database objects look like. That's it for this time. Please like, share, subscribe, let people know about my channel. And until next time, remember, I'm pulling for you. We're all in this together. Thank you.